Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xi Chen. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you about uh, uh, the topic uh, of uh, federated learning and its applications in uh, cybersecurity. Uh, here, this is the outline of today's presentation. Um, actually, first of all, we're going to talk about the background, and then we talk about the motivating examples of where federated learning may be introduced. And then we briefly talk about the federated learning and the differences between federated learning and the traditional distributed learning. We talk about the gradient descent and followed by the popular FED average algorithm. And then we talk about the application of federated learning and the use case study. Finally, we come to the conclu conclusion part. So first of all, the background. Uh, as we know, in recent years, uh, as the extensive development of the uh, IoT technology, there is an explosion of the availability of IoT and smart devices uh, across the world. Uh, from this figure, actually, we can see that uh, year by year, it is the number of the uh, IoT devices and also uh, the predictions uh, of number of devices in the future. From this figure, we can see that uh, uh, China, uh, North America, and Europe are the top three contributors of the number of IoT and smart devices. And it is predicted that by 2030, uh, the number of IoT and smart devices will be around 25.4 million uh, billion. So uh, as the number uh, as the number of IoT devices and smart devices grows, there's uh, also a growing concern in the data privacy and the security issue for the users. Uh, here, actually, you can say, uh, this is another uh, type of statistic about uh, the number of data breaches uh, from, 20, from 2005 until 2020. Uh, from this figure, we can see that more than, uh, actually more data breaches in 2020 than uh, the previous 15 years, even though uh, the cybersecurity investment grew 10% in 2020 to 53 billion. And also there is a cyber crime up to 600% 600 improvement due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the growing concern in the data privacy issue also lead to some more strict law and regulati regulations such as the GDPR of Europe 2018, GDPR of Europe of the US 2018 and the cybersecurity of law in China 2017. So this is the basic background about, uh, uh, about uh, where uh, federated learning will be, will be applied. Uh, so next, uh, let's go to say two motivating examples to get a specific idea of why we need the federated learning in our real world applications. Let's consider this first uh, problem. Uh, let's say there is a central server here. Let's say it is just uh, the Google platform. Uh, because let's say Google want to train a machine learning model or deep learning model for object detection for certain tasks, such as the traffic condition detection using users' real-time mobile data. So one solution of this problem is that maybe we can use this centralized learning, such as user just upload their real-time images to the central server, and then the server can just train the model using each user's image. However, the challenge is that users' images are sensitive information. It may contain very important spatial temporal information of each user. It may also uh, include some other sensitive informations, such as a car's license plate. So uh, this centralized learning method is not uh, uh, feasible in the real world. Another motivating example is, for example, let's say here, uh, there are different uh, multiple hospitals. Uh, they want to jointly train a machine learning model using patients' medical data in order to build a better disease diag diagnose algorithms for and detection algorithms. Actually, this scenario can also be applied for uh, the financial sectors such as banks or insurance companies because they also want to jointly train a better model for a specific task. Again, a possible solution, maybe we can just build a centralized learning uh, platform such, as, such that each, each hospital 
all each financial sectors, they update their local data to the central server. And then the central server just train a better model based on all those data. And again, uh, here the challenge is, is that for the hospitals, they are not allowed to share their patients' data to any third party entities or organizations. Similarly, for bank banks, for financial sectors and insurance companies, they are not allowed to share their uh, customers' uh, personal information to any other organizations. So here, let's, uh, let's, let's just do a summary here. Um, for the centralized learning algorithms, data are collected from different sources, such as both from the individual users or any organizations and then they transferred to a central server. And the central server just used all those data to, to train a better uh, machine learning or deep learning model for specific tasks. Uh, but this, is, uh, th this can bring several very serious uh, privacy disclosures uh, problems. This is why we need a, a federated learning actually. So here I just uh, described very briefly what is federated learning. So in federated learning, actually first we have multiple parties each of which owns some data, some local data. And then they want to collaboratively to train a machine learning and deep learning together. Also is that during the training process, no data held by each party will leave that party, which means that all the data will be kept locally and they do not transfer to the central server. And also next part is that only the necessary information will be transferred also under protection, such as some encryption technology in order to ensure that no party can re-engineer the data. And last is that the performance of the, result, uh, of the resulting model should be as good as the model which are built on a centralized learning process. So based on the brief discussion about the, uh, about the federated learning here, actually we summarized four different uh, characteristics of federated learning. First is uh, data isolation, which means that all the local data can just be kept locally. They are not leaked or transferred to any other party. Second is the equality, which means that each party in this whole training process are equal in status. The third one is the lossless, which means that they can get the same accuracy as all the data has been transferred to the central server. Last is the mutual benefit, which means that both the server can get the final model and for the, each client or each worker, they did not leak their data at all. So it is a kind of a mutual beneficial for each parties. Um, and here, I will just use this visualization to uh, further compare uh, the differences between centralized learning and federated learning. So first of all, let's say, if we consider here, there are three entities, sheep, grass, and farm. Sheep represent the model we want to optimize because sheep, we want the sheep to grow from a small sheep to a big sheep. And the grass just means the data because sheep need to eat the grass in order to grow and the model need to be fed with the data in order to be, become a better model. And the farm, actually, the farm owns the grass, which is similar to that each client or each worker owns their local data. So in a centralized learning way, actually all the data will be transferred to the, to the ship uh, in order to let the ship grow, which similarly as that all the data will be transferred to the model in order to optimize the model. However, in the federated learning way, first of all, uh, one important part is that all the grasses will be kept uh, by each farm, they did not transfer, which is similar that all the data will be kept locally by each client. They did not transfer to the center, central server. So how did we make the model grow? Or how did we make the ship grow? Actually, instead, the ship just go around to each local farm in order to become a big ship. Similarly, the model, it will be the, all the parameters will be transferred to each local worker in order to optimize the model. So this is a very direct comparison between centralized learning and federated learning. So uh, next, uh, let's uh, briefly discuss uh, three major steps in federated learning. Uh, it is called model selection, local model training, and aggregation of local mo models. So for the first step, 
because you can see here from this figure, we also have actually two type of entities. The first is the central server who owns the global model. The second entity is the each worker. We can call it each worker or each client. So each client, he, he or she owns some local data and then uh, he or she do not want to disclose this data to any central server. So let's say for the first step for the model selection part, uh, the central server will initialize the, this global model maybe by some, uh, some certain initialization or maybe just uh, create this global model by random. Uh, and then he just uh, transfer or share this global model to each client. So for the second step, which happened at each client side, each client just uh, after receiving the global model, they just use their local data to train the model. And which means that to train the parameters in the model. And after uh, the training finished, they just send, send the updated parameters back to the central server. This is the second step. And the last step is that after receiving all the updated parameters from all the workers, the central server just aggregated the parameters in order to update the whole global model. So in federated learning, it is a continuous iterative learning process which means that uh, both step two and step three will be repeated in multiple rounds in order to achieve a certain result. For example, either the model converges or maybe the model achieves a certain, uh, certain level of uh, accuracy. So this is the uh, general uh, idea of federated learning. So uh, here, maybe um, someone, if, if you are familiar with the traditional distributed learning, you may ask, Actually, the idea is uh, so similar as the traditional distributed learning. What is the major differences be between distributed learning and federated learning? Uh, and then here, I I'd like to discuss what is the major differences. Uh, because as, as we know, in distributed learning, it is also a multi-node learning system or process, which specifically designed for the big data set. In this process, we just involved the parallel or distributed algorithms on clusters of work node. Here, uh, as you can see here, in distributed learning, first of all, we also have a central server. And also, we also have a cluster of worker nodes. And here, let's say the server will send the latest parameters. Uh, sorry, here is a typo here. Server will send the latest parameters to each worker node. And then here, the communication complexity is just the number of work nodes in the system. And then each work node just updated the parameters with their local data and then send back the parameters to the server. So you can see here, data still do not live with the work node. But I want to say uh, the difference is that the objective of distributed learning and federated learning are different. In federated learning, our main goal is to protect worker, each local worker's local data. However, in the distributed learning, our major objective is to increase the efficiency of the overall uh, computation process so that we can distribute the, uh, the overall uh, computation task into, uh, uh, into the different uh, uh, tasks for each workload. So, which means that the objective is different. And also here, I summarized some other different type uh, of differences between federated learning and distributed learning. First of all, we need to accept that actually federated learning is kind of a distributed learning, but it's the following characteristics. So first of all, we can see here in federated learning, workers has the full control over their devices and data, which in this case, it is not happening in the traditional uh, distributed learning because in distributed learning, uh, the master, the central server, has full control of each work node. Second difference is, is that the work node are always heterogeneous in terms of, let's say, computational power, bandwidth, power, memory, and other computational resources. However, this is also not the case in traditional distributed learning because in traditional distributed learning, all the work node will have the equal computational power. Uh, the second part is that the communication cost is higher than the computation cost. The last different, the next difference is that data stored on each local work in federated learning is not uh, independent and identical distributed because 
here, each worker actually means each individual people or individual organization in our real world. So it is very likely that uh, the data distribution pattern stored on each local worker is different than each, with each other. The last difference is that the amount of data stored on each local worker is not balanced. For example, let's say uh, if the Google want to collect the real-time images from different workers, some workers in their cell phones, they may contain thousands of images. Some workers may contain only 10 or 20 of images. So the amount of data set in each local worker is also different. This is the major differences between federated learning and the distributed learning. So uh, actually next, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, one of the key, um, key nature of federated learning, as I mentioned here, which is lossless, which means that in federated learning, actually we can build a model with a higher performance as good as the centralized learning. So how can we achieve it? Uh, so in order to describe this problem, we need to first come to see the popular uh, optimization algorithms in deep learning and machine learning, which is called gradient descent. Uh, here, I just use these two dimensions to evaluate the, the uh, relationship between the parameters of the model and the loss function. Because as we know in machine learning, we want to optimize the parameters so that we can get the minimum value of the loss function. Uh, here, you can see here, let's say if for any point it's the current parameters, what we want to do is that we want to go through the direction of the gradient descent so that finally we can achieve the minimum value of the loss function. Uh, and we, we can see here the gradients can be considered as the partial derivation of the cost function with regard to the weight. And then we will use this equation to update the parameter. Uh, and each time we just use the original parameter minus the uh, learning rate times the gradient in order to achieve the minimum value of the loss function. So this is the popular gradient descent idea. So this idea can be used by federated learning in, achieve, in order to achieve the lossless uh, function. So uh, here, uh, I just discussed one popular algorithm in federated learning, which can achieve the same accuracy uh, as, the, uh, as the centralized learning. This algorithm is called a fat average algorithm, which is based on the gradient descent algorithm. So first of all, you can see here, this is the overall algorithm for the fat average algorithm. And here, I just summarize it as three key steps. So first of all, we can see here the aggregator, or we can see the central server. Then we are, uh, first of all, randomly select a subset of clients and initialize the global model X0. Here, actually the zero means the number of training round because there's no training yet. So uh, the training round, the number of training round equals to zero and the global model is X0. After generate this initialize the global model parameter X0, the central server just send all these X0s to all the selected clients. Next is happen at the client side. So each client, Will, because each client owns some local data, right? He will just uh, calculate the average gradients on his local data. And then he update the local parameters Xi by using this equation, similarly as the, what we just introduced in gradient descent algorithms. So after, after some epochs, the worker, each local workers will update the parameters, update their own parameters by this equation. I say worker one has the updated parameters X1 and so on. And then each workers just send back all these parameters back to the central server. And the last step, the central server or the aggregator just updated the global model by this equation, which is kind of the weighted average of all the updated parameters from each worker. That is why it, it is called Fed average algorithm. So finally, he gets the parameters X1 here, the one means this is the parameter we have after the first training round. So all this process will be repeated again and again uh, from multiple training round in order to achieve a certain performance. And then uh, th this is the overall idea of how fat average algorithm works. Yeah, so uh, actually recently we just do some research on this uh, 
uh, uh, Fed average algorithms. And we found that we, uh, this is some result we do for the popular minister data set with both the uh, IID data distribution and the non-IID data distribution. And we can find that actually after a, a certain time of training round, let's say 100, uh, maybe for the I, IID data, maybe it's just maybe around 10 training round. However, for the non-IID uh, data distribution, maybe after 100 training round, the federated, uh, uh, federated learning platform can also achieve a very high uh, detection performance for the mini, mini the data set. Uh, so next uh, is some, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, applications of federated learning. So we can combine federated learning with the existing machine learning algorithms, such as in different domains, such as computer vision, natural language processing, and transfer learning. Uh, we can also combine federated learning with some real world applications. As we mentioned, the healthcare problems, financial sector problems, smart cities, cyber physical systems, edge computings, and so on. Next, we, we would like to briefly discuss one of the application which combine both federated learning and mobile craft sensing. Uh, so what is mobile craft sensing? Actually, in mobile craft sensing, MCS, it involves a larger group of participants using their mobile devices with the aim of exchanging reliable and real-time data of common interest. For example, first of all, we have some task, task requesters. They may need some certain information, such that they want to do some traffic monitoring, road condition monitoring, and so on. So they just initialize this task to a server service provider. And then the service provider will be select a group, a, a big group of workers in real time. And each workers will use their smart devices to collect the re important real-time data. Finally, the data will be transferred back to the service provider and then finally transferred back to the each task requester. So you can see actually the mobile craft sensing idea is quite similar than the federated learning idea. There are two types of uh, applications. First of all is the environmental centric sensing application in mobile craft sensing, such as air quality monitoring, noise monitoring, road traffic monitoring. There are also another type is a people-centric sensing application, such as personal health monitoring, sports exercise monitoring, and social activity monitoring. And one example is that the real-world application is called Waze. It's a GPS navigation software owned by Google. Uh, in Waze, actually, we can achieve many real-time traffic monitoring services such that where is the traffic jam? Is there any construction? Is there any incident, uh, accident? And which road is the, is the best road between two uh, destinations? So uh, also recently in our group, actually we tried to study uh, how to combine federated learning with mobile craft sensing, which means, uh, which, uh, which in recently we just proposed a new sensing uh, paradigm called uh, federated mobile craft sensing. Because in this case, you can see here, each worker can be just the work as the each local data owner. He owns some data and the server or the task requester want to achieve certain task so that the worker need to update the important information regarding uh, to the task. So this is the overall federated mobile craft sensing platform. But there are two major questions in federated learning mobile craft sensing. First one is that because the workers, especially in the real world scenarios, each workers is really different in terms of their computational power, the size of their training data set, and the network connection and so on. So first question is that how to improve the overall efficiency of the training process by selecting the most suitable workers. And the, Another challenge is that how to protect users' parameter privacy. Uh, as you may ask, because we have already applied the federated learning in this case, why do we still need to consider the protecting users' privacy? So here, actually, you can see, even though in federated learning, the local data did not uh, are kept uh, all locally by the local data owner, they did not transfer to the third central server. However, 
there are still some possible information disclosure. Because the grid and information transferred between workers and the servers is still not safe to share because the, this grid and information can all, also include very important uh, statistical pattern of the local data set, which means that even though the data has been kept locally, we only transferred the gradient, but the gradient should also be protected. And some possible solutions uh, for protection the gradient, such as the homomorphic encryption and the differential privacy. Uh, here is some, uh, oh, oh yeah, by the way, because uh, today the time is a little bit limited. So uh, if, if anybody want to, um, uh, uh, know more information about uh, uh, the privacy issues in federated learning. Maybe you can you can you can both read our recent paper or just contact with us. Uh, so next is the existing federated learning platforms, uh, which are all open to the public and anybody can just use it uh, to train their own model and to use on their own uh, applications. So finally, is the conclusion of today's presentation. First of all, we know that data privacy has become a very big concern as the existing development of the IoT devices, uh, IoT technologies, uh, cloud computing and edge computing. And under this scenario, federated learning can be considered as a potential solution in order to protect users' local data privacy while still enable different applications in real world scenarios. And also in today's presentation, we introduce some differences between federated learning and the traditional distributed learning. Uh, we talk about how the popular federated average algorithm works for parameter optimization. We also show, uh, show you a case study about how to combine federated learning and mobile crowd sensing. Uh, finally, we talk about the security issues in federated learning. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, it's all, almost half an hour and I think that's uh, all my today's presentation. Thank you guys, bye-bye.